Zoom um, audience as well as the people in person. Uh, welcome to Civic's first gathering of the winter 2024 quarter. Uh, this event is also co-sponsored by UCR's Center for Ideas and Society. Uh, CIVIC is an acronym for the Council for in Intellectual Values and Inclusive Community. We're a grassroots group on campus, started quite organically last year by uh, Professor Stephen Brint and myself. Um, CIVIC's mission, in short, is to encourage open inquiry, viewpoint diver diversity, and constructive conversations. We hope to reinvigorate a campus culture that that prides itself on holding rigorous discussions, encouraging complex and challenging topics, and to do so in good faith and with the intention to learn and understand from one another. So today we, we will be having a panel discussion with two distinguished guests uh, to talk about div diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI policies and practices inside and outside of the university setting. Our provocative question for the day is whether these policies and practices should be retained, reformed, or removed. The format for today's panel will proceed as follows. Each guest uh, will present for 10 to 15 minutes. Following their presentations, I will open it up for, open up the floor for questions and comments. As moderator, I have the unfortunate job of enfor enforcing some rules of engagement. So, uh, I will alternate taking questions from our Zoom audience and our in-person audience. Uh, if you are called upon, this is a big request, please ask your question or make your comments succinctly and briefly. Please, no preambles, no niceties, no exceptions. This will give the most people an opportunity to speak. Simply put, don't hog the mic or ramble. Lastly, let's enjoy ourselves and recognize how fortunate we are to be here today. So we have two distinguished guests here for the panel. Uh, first, um, joining us is Ryan Ruffiner. Ryan is an industrial organizational psychologist and independent contractor specializing in organizational development and selection systems. He's also a professional speaker on psychology, spirituality, and ethical philosophy a member of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, a DEI researcher and member of the Committee for the Advancement of Professional Ethics. Um, he has a previously worked with Texas Children's Hospital, Houston Community College, Taligens, and the University of Houston, uh, Clear Lake. Secondly, joining us uh, via Zoom, I should say Ryan is in person and via Zoom is Kareth Foster. Kareth Foster is an American comedian, speaker, television and radio personality, actress, author, and entrepreneur. In 2016, Foster founded the Foster Russell Family Foundation, nonprofit organization which committed, uh, which is committed to inspiring free speech, social change, and empowerment through education and mentorship. As founder and president of Inversity Solutions, Foster has developed specific programs for diversity engagement through workshops, which she leads for groups, social organizations, and corporations. As a speaker, humorist, diversity expert, and best-selling author of You Can Be Perfect or You Can Be Happy, Kareth creates seismic shifts in DEIB through inversity methodology. Her blend of wisdom and humor inspires audiences to commit to inclusion and belonging, as CEO of Inversity Solutions and founder of nonprofit Frame, oh. Kareth lever leverages her background in media, HR, and comedy um, to transform challenging conversations into opportunities for growth, embracing oh. her motto, if you can laugh at it, you can get through it. Um, please extend a warm welcome to our guests. So we will be starting with Kareth, who will be... Um, taking over the Zoom screen to do the presentation and immediately following Ryan will um, do his presentation and I will come back to uh, to um, police the situation. All right. Thank you, Amir. Well, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Everyone on the Zoom, can I get a thumbs up if I can see you? 
We're good. Okay, fantastic. Um, what an absolute honor to join all of you today. I'm going to share my screen um, because there are just some slides I'd, I'd like to share. Um, because I think it's of note that, yes, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, but why am I credible? Why am I here to even have this conversation? And yes, I have had a, a very um, diverse career, as it were, uh, starting as a, I call myself a recovered journalist who then went into stand-up comedy. Um, I found it or it found me. I also worked in human resources in corporate America at Estee Lauder's corporate headquarters in New York City for some time. And that gave me exposure to what life was like in the white collar world, what was happening um, behind the scenes in HR, in human resources, with corporate programming. And uh, so while I was leading this double life as a stand-up comedian and an HR uh, uh, executive administrator, I um, really got to, you know, figure out what am I going to do with my life? What do I, what do I want to see? And I, I still had this desire to be on the air, to be in front of people, to bring the world together. And ultimately, um, I left to start a production company that lasted about 20 minutes. And I get a call from an old agent saying, Kara, would you be interested in a radio TV opportunity? And I said, uh, yeah, of course. And they said, by the way, it's with Don Imus. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but Don Imus was the famous shock jock uh, who predated Howard Stern. He was known for being a bit of a curmudgeon. Uh, his motto was, if uh, I'm not happy, you're not happy. And he got in trouble in 2007 for calling the Rutgers women's basketball team nappy-headed hoes. Now, that was something that I remember watching live on TV and thinking, oh my gosh, I should have been there. I should have been there to have this conversation. Why was what he said completely inappropriate? Why did it not land as the joke he thought it was going to be? Um, and what is the conversation that could have been had around it? Well, I, I did get that opportunity after he got taken off the air um, and then had a chance to redeem himself. That position to have this quote unquote national dialogue about race and racism in America was really what set me on the path for what was happening in the world of DEI. Um, because that wasn't really in my my sights. Um, I wanted to, yes, bring the world together and have a good time. But diversity, I, I thought that had been taken care of, you know, the civil rights movement. We've been working and having programs in DEI for, for decades now, spending millions, now billions of dollars. But the closer I looked, the closer I saw that even with all the money, the time, the effort, the energy, the marches, the 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 protests, it, it felt like it was two steps forward, 10 steps back. And this first slide that I have, you know, is a wonderful example of the amazing press that I've been able to garner in an effort to bring an awareness to the fact that, you know, DEI in and of itself is not a bad thing. The way that it is being done, the approach the methodology, that is what needs to be reformed. And that is my stance in this argument, whether it's we're talking about DEI in an academic space or in a corporate space. Um, I think that there have been a lot of really well-intentioned people who've been misguided in their approach to how we can have effective diversity and inclusion. Um, you may see the the International Business Times article, you know, quotes me as saying, you know, I'm, I'm working to counter the deception, the delusion, and the distraction that is plaguing DEI. And 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 I am. And that's not always met with uh, warm hugs and open arms because I am, in fact, um, really bucking a system that's been in place for some time. Uh, there are some people that think it's not broken. I am here to say I think that it is. I don't think it's broken by anyone whose heart and mind is in the right place. I think it's broken by a a culture that thinks that, you know, diversity only applies if you're from a quote unquote marginalized group, um, you know, that it is a black and white issue, literally and figuratively. It is not. True diversity is diversity of everything that we are. It is diversity of um, thought 
and ideas. And unfortunately, we've been siphoned into thinking or believing or being told that there is just one way to think about it and to address it. And so, you know, I've had some incredible opportunities to take this new message of what I call inversity, um, both to colleges, universities, corporations, um, conferences, and, you know, really be able to shed light on the fact that, you know, we don't just have to do something one way. There is a new approach. There is another way to see things. There's another way to do things, but it is going to take a reframe. It is going to take um, changing the narrative. Um, it is going to take opening our minds. I am not here to say that racism and sexism and anti-Semitism, all the isms and phobias out there, that they don't exist. They they do, and they're very real. And that is why you can't throw diversity out completely. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that is something that I shared. Um, I don't know how many of you were able to catch it, but I was on the debate stage at MIT, uh, sponsored by the MIT Free Speech Alliance. And I was with some you know, heavy hitting members of academia who were like, no, it's not serving anybody. We've got to get rid of it. It needs to be gone. And to the contrary, you know, I, while I did agree with some of the points they had and they agreed with points I had, um, you, you can't just completely get rid of something that really could be powerful, that really could unite us and bring us together and um, empower one of us. You know, instead of stripping people of their agency, um, instead of, you know, saying that people who are a quote unquote marginalized group will always consistently be secondhand, second class citizens. Like to me, that is so disrespectful. That is, is where the true racism, I think, comes out in a lot of these efforts um, to say that, you know, people don't have the capability of rising above um, any stigma that's been placed on them because of their physical ability, because of their gender, because of their ethnicity. Um, there are so many areas that we really still need diversity and inclusion and belonging to be part of. And I, I did not say equity, and I, I really don't speak to that so much because I don't think people even have a full definition of what they mean by equity. I, I have been in conferences where there have been six to 10 other DEI experts, and they all have a different definition. So until we can fully define it, I don't even know if we should talk about it. But quite honestly, I think that it will come about and equality will come about if we can get diversity and inclusion down. Um, and my thoughts on belonging, which is the new, you know, letter to the acronym, right? Uh, there's also the J, right? There's Jedi now and um, for justice. But the B for belonging, I think, you know, we've, again, kind of created this narrative that belonging is solely the responsibility of an organization or a school to make sure that they are doing everything in their power um, to ensure that people feel like they're part of something. Well, guess what? It's not a one-way street, okay? None of this is. None of this is one-way. It's not even bi-directional. This is a six-lane highway that we are navigating, and the only way we can possibly do it in an effective way is if we shift how we think. And that is why I, I came up with the term inversity. I mean, looking at the word diversity, I love words as a comedian, as an author, as a wordsmith. Um, the word diversity, break it down. The first three letters are D-I-V. What other words start with that? Divide, division, divorce. And yet we are expecting diversity to bring people together. Well, Guess what? Look at where we are now. How is that working out for us? Not not very well. Again, not because it's a bad thing, but I think because of what we have aligned with what appropriate diversity is. And we need to broaden that uh, definition and our horizons on it. So inversity is still the acknowledgement and the honoring of all that we are, who we are, our identities, what we bring to the table, right? It's about being truly inclusive of everyone, not saying because you're a straight white guy, you've not shared the experience that I have, you have no room in this conversation. That's not how you win friends and influence people, okay? That's also not how you make people feel truly included. Multi-lane highway we are on. 
And so I will share just a, a couple of the things. You can obviously go to my website, but I, I really wanted to make a point of um, explaining what inversity is, that it's not just some new catchword or buzz phrase. Um, it, it's, it's or catchphrase or buzzword, <laughs> there you go. Um, but it's it's an ideology, right? And it's a methodology and it's one that's been incredibly sex, successful for myself um, and my efforts when I go into these organizations that are struggling with wanting to do the right thing, that are truly committed to having an inclusive environment that are committed to creating spaces where they value the people that they work with. And, you know, the thing about adversity is that, again, it's not just this word to make people feel like, oh, rainbows and unicorns and everything's great with the world. It's about doing the real work. You know, our motto is, you know, it's not hard work, it's heart work. And that's because this isn't just a mind game, right? This is about touching people in their hearts, which, by the way, neuroscience nerd here a little bit um the heart is an organ that it doesn't just pump blood through our bodies it actually is a little brain it has over forty thousand nerve receptors that allow you to think and feel and reason and and emote separately from the brain even learn and that's why we have to do that's where we need to go with this so you know the final part of adversity you know, yes, it's about focusing on what we have in common, being truly inclusive, but also being introspective, right? Meaning understanding your value and worth so that you can see it in someone else. And I think that that's been a bit of a deficit for what has been happening in the name of DEI for so many decades. You know, we've been trying to work from the outside in. We've been thinking if we just train people to say the right words and the right phrases and tell people they can't use this and they have to change their language or they you know, can't have this belief system, then that's going to make all the difference. When in fact, it really isn't. Um, people have to want to change, first of all, and that change has to come from something inside of them. You know, some of the best compliments that I've ever received in doing this work have come from people in academic settings, actually. I was at a college in Iowa for their employee development day. And after I spoke, an older woman came up to me. It was Iowa, so you know she wasn't <laughs> likely brown. Um, but she came up to me and she said, you know, Kara, I, I've been in education for 25 years. I've been going to these diversity programs for 20 of those years. This is one of the best ones that I've ever been to. And of course, I was flattered. I, look, I appreciate the niceties. I know you were told not to you know, put any out in the Q&A, but I, I, I was flattered and that meant a great deal to me. And then she said something that I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be followed by a backhanded compliment because she goes, I don't know how to tell this to you. I go, okay. She goes, but I have no idea what your political affiliation is. And my response was good, good. You're not supposed to know what my political affiliation is in my doing this work. That should be as secretive as who I vote for, what religion I practice, because that's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to put my belief system on you. I'm here to teach you and your colleagues how to communicate effectively, how to have conscious empathy, how to have noble compassion so that you can not only have healthy relationships with your colleagues and your students and the communities that you serve, but that you can internally choose to be a good person, a good person. And most of us are, I swear to you, I believe 90% of people on this planet are good people, but we get caught up in wanting to, you know, play a role, right? Wanting to be self-righteous, right? That's kind of part of the human, I think, blueprint. We want to feel good. We want to look good. Um, you know, that's why virtue signaling happens so frequently and so often. Um, it's also why people don't stand up when they know diversity isn't being done well or in a healthy way because they're scared of being an outlier. You know, I often think of the Solomon Ash um, experiment from 1951 where he had people, you know, a control group and then the one experiment person was uh, the person who had no idea what was going on. Eight people in a group, seven of them knew what was happening. And he showed them a line and three lines, actually. And he asked, you know, are these lines all the same 
same length. And initially they were, so everyone was in agreement. The next time he showed them and, a, and one of the lines was shorter than the others. But the seven people who were in on it, they said, nope, they're all the same length. And guess what? 75% of the time, the eighth person agreed, even though they knew in their heart of hearts it was wrong because they wanted to belong so badly, so strongly. And so I think that we have a lot of that happening right now in the DEI conversation where people know things aren't being done well. They aren't healthy. They're toxic. Um, but they're too scared because they don't want to be canceled. They don't want to be shamed. Um, they don't want to be pushed out, right, of their of their community to, to say anything. And so my ask in the work that I do uh, and of everyone here is to be braver, to be bolder, and to say, look, this isn't okay. That doesn't mean to be vitriolic and attack, even though that is a response. Um, as you'll see, you know, reason versus reaction. We are programmed to react when something throws us off, when something is upsetting. And there's nothing more that we like sometimes than some good old fashioned, you know, fraud and choid, right? Or choid and fraud, choid and fraud, fraud and choid, fraud and choid. Um, um, Kareth, excuse me, just one second. Um, yeah. We're going to have to wrap yours up. No in worries. A minute or two. I, this thank is you. the very last of it. Okay. So with that, I just want to say thank you and let you know that that's where I'm coming from and my stance. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we are going to uh, go next to Ryan, who will be presenting here. Let's make sure the Zoom thing switch over. Okay. Thank you. You mean with the uh, the wide angle? Okay. Ooh. Looks like we got a. What is that? Okay. Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's okay. We just gotta, oh, infinite windows. Okay, that'll be fine. So thank you, first of all, for having me here. Uh, I am firmly on the remove DEI side. From my own research, um, and I've been following DEI for a number of years, it seems that DEI is not concerned with diversity, equity, and inclusion any more than North Korea is concerned with becoming a democratic people's republic, just because that is what it calls itself. I believe that we need to see past the euphemisms and Orwellian doublespeak that DEI uses to try to justify itself and to spread itself through our institutions and organizations. When I look at what DEI actually does in terms of what it promotes, the policies and procedures it creates and the outcomes that it advocates for, I don't see an organization or institution dedicated to diversity, equity, inclusion. I see an institution that is dedicated to discrimination, exclusion, and inequality. When they say they are for diversity, what I actually see is they are for discriminating against majority groups and in favor of minority groups on the basis of immutable, job-irrelevant, surface-level characteristics like race and gender. When I see them talk about equity, which is one of the flimsier parts of their um, of the DEI um, institution, which is why it, some organizations has, have dropped it from their uh, departments. I don't see equality of opportunity. I see forced outcomes based, again, on job irrelevant surface level characteristics. And when I see inclusion, I see an emphasis on including what are considered the right people, right being determined not just by having the right surface level characteristics like race, gender, and sexuality, but also by bowing down to and agreeing to evangelize a certain almost religious worldview. And I want to make that clear because you can be a black woman in the DEI industry and still be cast out for not going along with what they think. This happened to Dr. Tabia Lee, who objected to some of the discriminatory DEI policies that were happening at the university where she was a director. She was in a director level position and they fired her saying that she had internalized white supremacy. And when she tried to defend herself, they said you must uh, that she was white splaining. 
So they were not interested in what she had to say. They were not interested in any justifications, ethical or logical. They just got rid of her. So not only does DEI not seem to care about what DEI says it cares about, it also violates all four types of organizational justice. There is procedural justice, uh, distributive justice, informational justice, and uh, interpersonal justice. These are in the IO psychology literature. So in terms of procedural justice, DEI violates procedural justice by creating and promoting unjust policies and procedures that discriminate against people, again, on the basis of immutable job irrelevant surface level characteristics. They create and promote systems that lead to uh, unjust reward and resource distribution based on surface level characteristics like race and gender. Then they lie about the effects of these and the intent of these, and they pretend that they are good for society and their employees' well-being and that they are respectful of human dignity. But this could not be further from the truth. Now, there's a lot, there's been a lot written already about um, how critical theories and so-called woke ideology influence the DEI institution. And although all of those things are interesting and we do need to talk about that, that's not the reason why I'm here today. That's not primarily what my research is concerned with. My research is concerned with the strongest possible justifications for DEI in the best possible way that we could do them. And what I found is that there are three possible theories that might justify some of the most well-intentioned pushes for DEI, and yet even those fall drastically short. In fact, DEI seems to actively sabotage all of these or ignore them completely. So, for example, there is the similarity attraction paradigm. The similarity attraction paradigm says that we tend to be more attracted to people that we perceive as similar to ourselves and, well, what DEI thinks this means is that we are more attracted to people who are similar to ourselves based on surface level characteristics like race and gender. But this is not what the similarity attraction paradigm actually means. What it actually means is that we are more attracted to people based on whether or not we think they're similar to us. And one of the most major sources of attraction between people are deep level qualities, like whether you agree on opinions, values, beliefs, interests, whether your personalities align or not. There are decades of research to show this is the case, but if you don't believe me, you can also think about um, sports fans, online fan bases, hobbyists, interest groups, even social justice activists. If you look at them, they are often made up of people of different races, different genders, different sexualities, different gender identities, and yet they are all united in their shared similarities based on attitude and values and beliefs. So similarity in attitudes and deep level characteristics are a much bigger source of attraction between people. It turns out that these also have a heavy impact on the important workforce outcomes that people are concerned with. So, for example, there is a team of researchers who investigated the effects of deep level diversity versus uh, surface level diversity on workplace outcomes like uh, employees, uh, co-worker satisfaction, supervisor satisfaction, uh, general job satisfaction, and organizational commitment. Now, DEI would like us to believe that one of the most important factors to people is to see themselves, quote unquote, represented, represented in leadership, like supervisors, represented among their colleagues, and that this will help retain employees if we include all this representation. But it turns out this is not true. Deep level diversity variables have the strongest connection between all of these important workplace outcomes, not service level diversity. I'll give you an example. In this study, uh, the researchers found that group cohesion had a significant correlation with similarities in values, interests, and personality traits. They also found that over time, deep level diversity mattered more and had a greater impact on workplace outcomes than surface level diversity. So as time went on, deep level diversity mattered more or deep level similarities mattered more and surface level diversity mattered less. The researchers also pointed out that even though we may, and I want to emphasize may, initially categorize people or judge them based on uh, stereotypes or past experience, which are not the same thing necessarily, we don't always do this. And when we do, we almost always modify these initial judgments or replace these initial judgments with deeper level knowledge of a person's character once we get to know them better. 
They concluded by saying that if we really want to help teams get along well, whether they are diverse or not, what we need to do is to encourage rich, meaningful social interaction that goes deeper than the surface level divisions that DEI often overemphasizes. We also need to encourage people to work on meaningful interdependent tasks where they rely on each other to succeed, not sit through trainings on how some people are oppressed and other people are oppressors and so on and so forth. So the similarity attraction paradigm does not support DEI. Then there is the social categorization theory. The social categorization theory says that we tend to categorize each other as either similar or different to ourselves based on social categories that we perceive are salient. Now, these may, this means uh, whether we think they are notable and important. DEI thinks this means that we categorize other people based on surface level social categories. We do this immediately and we do it over time. And the only way we stop doing this is if we have somebody from their department come in and say, hey, did you know racism is wrong? And then we go, oh, okay, now I know. Well, it turns out that DEI is wrong on this account as well. So a team of researchers was investigating the connection between social category salience and fault lines. Fault lines are hypothetical dividing lines that can divide a heterogeneous group into relatively homogeneous subgroups. So if you have a diverse team in the way that diversity, equity, inclusion typically thinks of as a diverse team, you could divide that group into male, female, black, white, black male, black female, white male, white female, and so on and so forth. So they investigated the relationship between fault lines and social category salience, and it found that just because groups could be divided along these lines did not mean that people always did so. They did not necessarily find these categories to be meaningful. Contrary to what DEI teaches when it says that these categories are not only important, but that people are constantly judging each other based on these social categories. They also found that there is a cost to believing that our social categories are aligned with deeper level characteristics. For example, they found that if people believe their teammates' actions were correlated with divisions into social categories, they exchanged less information with each other. Information elaboration went down. But if they noticed their differences, but they didn't necessarily categorize people's behaviors based on those certain social categories like race and gender, information elaboration increased. And what they took this to mean was that it is fine if we notice each other's differences, maybe even good, so long as we do not correlate those with certain social categories. Again, this is the opposite of what DEI teaches, when it teaches that we can use surface-level variables as proxies for deep-level characteristics. It doesn't work. So the similarity attraction paradigm doesn't work to support DEI. The social categorization theory doesn't work to do support DEI. There's one more theory that could be used, and like the others, DEI does it wrong. It's called the contact hypothesis. The contact hypothesis says that you can reduce prejudice between two groups of people if you make those two groups interact and ideally engage in rich, meaningful social interactions. However, DEI goes about this in the worst way possible because the contact hypothesis only works if four key conditions are met. People have to have equal status. They have to engage in cooperation. They have to engage in common goals, and they have to have fair institutional support. So equal status. How can people have equal status if we are constantly being taught to slot ourselves into an ever-increasing and complicated hierarchy of oppressor and oppressed based on little more than a combination of our surface-level characteristics? We can't engage in equal status like that. When it comes to common goals, how can we engage in common goals if DEI institutions and departments are telling us that we should shift our focus away from whatever unifying mission or organization is expressly dedicated to, to pursuing and turn us towards evangelizing what is basically a religion of identity based, uh, an identity based crusade. That takes away the common goals that could unite us and could make people really solve the world's problems. If every single institution in the world gets DEI scope creep and starts focusing on DEI goals rather than what they're doing, 
Who is going to solve problems related to infrastructure or medicine? So common goals are impossible under DEI, also partly because under DEI, some people are labeled enemies. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what you do. Even if you are right, they will say you have internalized this, internalized that. When it comes to cooperation, how can we engage in cooperation if we are taught that some people inherently have an advantage, not based on circumstances, not based on freely chosen actions, not even based on economic upbringing or whether they have two parents in the home or any of the, the other factors that we know can contribute to a, let's say, advantaged life and a disadvantaged life, but based on immutable surface level characteristics and nothing else. This doesn't set up a culture of cooperation. It sets up a culture of identity-based competition. And finally, there is fair institutional support. How can we say that people have fair institutional support in a way that would help the contact hypothesis work through DEI if DEI is incessantly pushing for hiring, promoting, evaluating policy and reward and resource distributions based on job irrelevant surface level characteristics that have nothing to do with the content of people's characters and nothing to do with their competency in knowledge, skills, and abilities? I want to be clear here. We could talk about critical theories and woke ideology, but I think it is useful to add to this discussion the fact that even the most sensible theories that could justify DEI don't work. DEI actively sabotages them, which is why I believe the solution is to remove DEI. Remove DEI departments and institutions and create better, stronger, fairer systems in their place. So for example, remove all surface level characteristics and ideological loyalty tests such as commitments to DEI from consideration in hiring, firing, evaluating, and reward and resource distributions. Focus instead on unbiased, um, job relevant, behaviorally demonstrated knowledge, skills, and abilities. We also need to go back to teaching people that there is no meaningful correlation between people's surface level traits and the content of their character or the competency of their knowledge, skills, and abilities, and that you cannot use surface level traits as proxies for deep level qualities like attitudes, beliefs, values, interests, and personality traits. DEI, in my opinion, is unsalvageable, and therefore we need to dismantle it and build something better in its place. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but uh, in a format like this, I'm going to completely ignore the chat. So if you're chatting among one another, have at it. Um, uh, I just can't cope. But if you want to speak uh, a question, you can raise your hand from the Zoom world, and I'll get to it. If you want to speak from the audience, I'm just going to hand you the mic, and hopefully you will um, uh, uh, be able to be spoke, uh, heard. Okay, so I don't see any hands on Zoom yet, so I see Steve, so I'm going to hand it in. Okay, thank you uh, to the speakers. Uh, really appreciate those interesting statements. So nobody has taken the retain side of this. Um, and I was a longtime supporter of affirmative action, and I've become a skeptic of uh, DEI over time. But just to set it in terms of what it's intended to accomplish in the academic setting, there are problematic climate issues for, um, for many students, but they affect uh, minority students and faculty more. In other words, they feel less connected to the campus and less appreciated. Uh, there's occasional, there's some hate crimes that are committed against minorities and women. Um, when I was checking this, it was about 800 a year. That's 5,000 colleges and universities. So, you, you know, it's not a huge amount, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, there's the issue of representation. Uh, there's not as many uh, minority faculty, for example, in positions as uh, anywhere near what their population proportion is. And um, and so 
there are some rationale for DEI for retaining it. The issue in my mind is this, or two issues. One is, as much as I look, I cannot find um, good studies that demonstrate that any of the outcomes that you expect to see if it was working properly are actually happening. So in other words, has does the size of the DEI office, for example, is it uh, correlated with an improved campus climate? Is it correlated with uh, improved retention of minority faculty? Um, and then, so those issues of outcomes, is it uh, correlated with reduced hate crimes? Is it correlated with increased representation above what you would imagine due to um, changing pipeline? And then the, the other one is, what are the costs? Those are not assessed either. Are the, if there are costs in terms of the climate for speech, uh, how would you, you know, is that the case? And do you want to trade off the possible benefits for the costs? And I'm just wondering whether either of you or maybe anyone else who's tuning in um, has good data about this because it is really hard to find as far as I'm concerned. I'll jump in and say that, you know, isn't it interesting that there aren't a lot of studies on this, if any, um, which speaks to the point of the fact that there are many people who know that the DEI that has been done is actually um, is actually toxic, is actually causing more harm than good. And a lot of what Ryan said, I, I have no argument with. The argument I have is that it can't be reformed. I believe that it can and it should be. Um, because quite frankly, you know, you're not going to be able to just completely say we can't do this anymore. There are people who are committed to making better environments, um, in their workspace, in their communities, in their homes. And you're not going to just eliminate or eradicate eons of, of programming of unconscious bias. Yes, we should not be looking at someone's skin color or their gender when we meet them. But guess what? In the first six seconds of meeting somebody, we know whether or not we're going to date them or not. And I'm not even, I don't, like, date isn't even the right term because this is a family show, okay? But that's how our brains work. We're not going to rewire people's brains like that. So we have to do it in a methodology that allows them, under the umbrella of diversity, right, to get new ideas on how to process, how to engage, how to communicate, and and how to, you know, receive information from one another and process it. But there's no studies because people know it's not working. And it's the same people that are perpetuating the same horrible practices of DEI, which I'm looking to reform. And I'm not alone. There are other people, too. It's not just me. Like, I know some people are like, is this an infomercial for adversity? It's not. But I'm one of the few people out there that's like, no, we've got to save this. It can't just go down the drain. There is something we could do. We just have to get more people on board. Uh, Chris, you go ahead. Sure. Thank you both for your great presentation. So it was very, very interesting and, and uh, uh, very succinct, which is nice. Um, my question is actually for both of you, and it's a little bit of a speculative one, um, but I'm curious how you both would diagnose where DEI went wrong, since you both have a, a, a critical view of the uh, ideals. Uh, was it driven off the rails by overzealousness or by those who uh, saw the ideals in it? Or was it in some ways an opportunistic uh, hijacking among those who in some way might gain something? Are there other problems? How did this go so wrong uh, in your view? As well, uh, I'd be very curious to hear. Okay. Um, so I think I can take this question. Uh where did it go wrong? You know, I think it's been wrong from the very beginning. It, it, the way I see DEI right now, it's it's like that really toxic relationship that you that a lot of other people can see is wrong, uh, but the person in it can't see that it's wrong. And maybe some people are looking at them like, why are you doing this? Why are you staying in this? And they're completely oblivious to it until they wake up. They go, you know, it was wrong for a long time, and I just didn't see it. Um, there was an article I was reading, a research, a research paper, that was talking about 
a lot of the problems with DEI, and I'm, I'm not going to list all the things that it mentioned, but I will list a couple. They said one of the main problems of DEI is that it, um, a lot of the DEI trainers or diversity trainers tend to project their own worldviews and ideologies onto people. It tends to turn into a white male bash session where they insult white men. They seem to confuse correlation with causation, with unequal opportunities, uh, unequal outcomes with unequal opportunities, all these things, right? Except here, here's the thing that I found interesting about this. This research paper, this article is not five years old. It's not 10 years old. It's not 20 years old. It's over 30 years old. OK, and when you read things like that, you begin to see that, you know, when we talk about like DEI has has become bad, I would argue that it's been bad for a long time. It's just that we haven't been most of us have not been aware of it. Um, there is and this is where I have to go a little bit away from the research and start talking about some of the underlying ideology of DEI. Um, the underlying ideology of DEI is such that it doesn't matter what you mean it doesn't matter what is true so truth doesn't matter and intentions doesn't don't matter if you say something and i don't like it and you belong to an identity group that i don't like or care about or you just say something then i'm going to find a conclusion and make the facts fit okay so if you say you know well you know uh, unequal outcomes don't mean unequal opportunities then i will accuse you of something and your implications, whatever you meant to imply, and your intentions don't matter. You mean whatever my most cynical interpretation of your words mean, all right? So where where did DEI go wrong? I think it's been wrong for a long time. It's just increased since then. I mean, this, this is, I think this is the part where, where, where me and Kareth disagree. I think DEI, because of the underlying ideology, is fundamentally unsalvageable, and we have to build something else. I I also, though, am hopeful because I see that most of the things that we could use to build a new system to create strong, fair selection procedures, for example, already exist, and there are companies who are already doing it. Uh, I will also say that when it comes to uh, the civil rights movement, when it came to uh, women's suffrage, when it came to a lot of the big moments in history where we made leaps and bounds in justice, DEI did not exist. We did it without DEI. I would just like to add that I, I think that from the beginning, it, it has been an issue. Um, and I think it's played on the hearts and minds of good people. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to try to take anyone down a rabbit hole here, but I think often of, you know, every great general, every great um, person who has been in any kind of war. And, you know, the rule is divide and conquer. Right. And, and so a lot of, Diversity work has been about furthering the divide between us so that we cannot come together to look at the bigger things that are happening in the world, like what is going on with our education system, what is going on in our food, in our water. Um, and I know that takes it to a whole other level, but that is why I am so committed to creating these conversations where people can see their commonalities versus the things that we're being told, the surface stuff, right? Right. That doesn't matter. Um, yes, thank you. I think you do both agree on uh, the idea that the implementation of DEI is problematic. And I think Ryan might not share the goal of it, and Karen might, might have the goal. But what I'm, and I am also uh, very critical of the way it's implemented. I, I think that's beyond dispute, although I think our administration here would dispute it, and none of them is here. Um, but I think, Ryan, you might undervalue or not be sufficiently attentive to the reasons we, we the situation is not just or uh, problematic. So you say that surface level characteristics are not associated with the desired deep level characteristics. But what I'm wondering is whether, you know, black people and brown people in this country, by and large, have different experiences from us whites. <laughs> Let's put it that way, especially white males. Um, and I think there's a value to bringing in people to our conversation who have had different experiences. 
So if we junked DEI and had a system where, let's say in the University of California, we ended up with 95% whites and 5% black and brown people, that would be a big problem, I think. Not because uh, race um, correlates with deep features, uh, differences in deep features, but it does correlate with different experiences. And I think, for instance, the UC, for whatever its faults, now uses neighborhood, let's say, as a proxy for race and a proxy for poverty and different experiences. Uh, what I'm saying is I, I share the skepticism with the way it's implemented, but there is a need to bring people with different experiences into our conversation. And we need to find ways of doing that. Okay, so I want to make sure I get the, the question right. Um, it's, you know, how do we acknowledge that people who belong to, let's say, different races have different experiences? Um, so I think, I think it's true of some people, but I don't necessarily think that it's true of all people. So, so here's, what, here's one contradiction I've seen um, among DEI people and, and, and DEI kind of thinking. Um, I'll see on the one hand, people say things like black people are not a monolith. There's actually a lot of diversity among black people, which is true. But then I'll see in the next instance, we need to talk to back black people to get the black experience. Okay, so on the one hand, they're saying that there is – a lot of diversity and differences within the black community, but also there is something called the black experience. Uh, and one example where this is got really weird was I was reading an article by this lady who is um, commenting on the Larry Elder Gavin Newsom race. And in one sentence in the article, she said, uh, you know, black people are not a monolith. There's a lot of diversity. And then she said, if you vote for Larry Elder, you have betrayed blackness. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. It's like, well, how can you say that there's not, a monolith in this community, but if you disagree with me, then you have betrayed this singular monolithic idea. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't some experiences that people of certain social categories don't tend to have, but for example, if I ask, if I just go out on the street and I ask a black person and I say, let's say I make a stereotype and say, well, you're black. Have you had any run-ins with the police? Uh, I don't, I don't know. That seems a little sketchy to me. Um, I think that just because something is correlated with it doesn't mean that there is necessarily a strong correlation with it. Um, another sort of discrepancy I see is the conflation of culture and race. So, for example, people will say that we need to encourage more black people in our organization to get multicultural perspectives, but this conflates race and culture. And I'll give you an example of why this is ridiculous, because a black person who is born and raised in California or Texas has very different lived experiences from a black person who is born and raised in Ghana, from a black person who is born and raised in London or in some kind of rural part of Nebraska. A Hispanic person who is born and raised in New York has a very different cultural experience and lived experience from a Hispanic person born and raised in Spain or Guatemala. And a white person, speaking of race, white people, a white person born and raised in Texas has a very different cultural experience and lived experience than a white person who was born and raised in Sweden. Okay. So on the one hand, I see that there are certain correlations between possible correlations between certain surface level characteristics and experiences. For example, I will never know what it's like to carry a child inside me because I'm a man. All right. I won't know what it's like to be black, but that doesn't necessarily mean that black people and I can't connect on certain level experiences. Um, I think there is a a danger for reductiveness. Uh, I think there's a danger of reductiveness if we assume that we can use a person's skin color as a direct proxy for certain behavioral or life experiences. I would much rather say, you know, if you have had a run with the police, or if you felt unsafe because of your race, then let's talk about that rather than assume that might be the case. If I could chime in and say that that's exactly why we do need the 
healthy diversity conversations and the inclusion of people to be able to share those experiences in a setting that is not set up to be an attack, but a setting that is about free speech. It is about civil discourse. Is it? A, it is about being able to have a, a conversation, right, that allows people to examine someone else's experience without it having to be their own. Um, to to acknowledge. I mean, you just said, you know, you don't know what it's like to carry a child. I, I do. Um, you will never know what it's like then to have to find a place to nurse. I have, as have many women who are in an environment. You know, when I was at MIT and doing that debate, we had a young woman stand up who said, you know, you know she was asking the people who were for eradicating DEI from all of academia. And she said, but, you know, I, I, I was just part of a, a conversation, I guess, Apple, I don't want to call anybody out, but some technological company who has an app had this wonderful new app rollout to monitor people's everything about their health, right? Their heart rate, their this, that, and the other. Guess what the one thing was missing? Anything that involved a menstrual cycle. Guess how many people were involved in creating that app that happened to have one? Zero. This is why I'm not saying we have to have mandatory amount of women or black people, but you've got to include people. There's a reason why people of darker complexions tend to be more, you know, have the opportunity of being hit by a Tesla in reverse because they can't recognize color. You, if you don't have people who've had that experience, we're going to lose out, not just on, you know, connections, but on money. Like if this has to be a bottom line about money thing, make it that. But that's why diversity is important. Thank you. Uh, Randy Leos, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am in the reform camp on this uh, issue. And I do think that there are studies that show that some approaches to DEI are effective. And really, I, I think the best of DEI is the idea of being open to other people's experiences and perspectives and and also othering people less, yeah. right? And I also agree with the previous commenter who talked about, you know, a diversity of perspective is still really valuable for organizations and the people within them, right? And and I think, you know, Kareth was, uh, was reflecting this as well. Um, and a diversity of demographics, while that is clearly not the only thing we should be going on, uh, mm -hmm. does uh, lend itself to a diversity of experiences that are based on you know, how society tends to see and uh, and relate to folks of different demographic categories. So I think we absolutely have to understand those differences uh, yeah. in their experience yeah. to, to be able to, you know, ref, uh, have those reflected in our, you know, the policies we create and, and the, the way that organizations operate. I think that's, that's so incredibly important. Um, but, I, and, and also organizations are a really important shared space for encountering those that we disagree with, uh, right? We're, we're filtering ourselves geographically in this country and, and sorting ourselves by politics. And, and so organizations, especially workplaces, are some of the last bastions of, of shared space where, you know, people tend to have uh, a, a, a group of friends that are more diverse, uh, not only politically, but religiously, um, you know, and, and in other, in other metrics, uh, and then they do in their, in their friend group. So we have to lean on this as a venue for understanding one another better, right? So workplaces really need to do this, but there are pitfalls, right? So people were asking, what are, where has DEI gone wrong? And I think this is, these are the kinds of things that we need to reform. Asking people to step back from a conversation because of their identity, or something that they can't control, right? And clearly that makes people check out from the conversation. It, it doesn't have the uh, intended impact on them. And so we definitely need to be uh, mindful of not doing that. And I think that's a very common pitfall. Um, and using the idea of blame rather than awareness, right? So um, we, we should definitely be making people aware of their biases, but we should also say, look, I have biases. We all have biases. People... Uh, of every category have biases against other people of, of a variety of categories. So, so awareness of that is, has a lot of utility, 
Um, and, and also things like uh, employee resource groups have shown to be valuable, but not in isolation, right? If, if they don't have uh, support from management, if they're isolated from the rest of the organization, then it's not going to help people of that category feel more uh, of a sense of belonging in the organization. So I think that's something that uh, would need to be addressed as well. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's my thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to respond? You want to respond to um, Kareth wants to speak. Kareth, do you have any response to that? or? I, I was just nodding in agreement. Um, okay. And I agree with the, the, the ERG thing, and because I've seen it go, like, both ways. If they are in isolation, then it just becomes segregation 2.0, and that's not helpful for anyone. Um, so you know, there, there's there's such a fine line here between the contradictions and the hypocrisy that can come up. Um, and it's, you know, going back to what Ryan said earlier, yeah, you know, there are so many people who want to make a case and then they'll contradict themselves two sentences later. Um, we do have very different experiences, every single one of us. I am a black person who grew up in Plano, Texas. OK, very different life from my cousins, my family who grew up in Camden, New Jersey. Um, do we have commonalities? Do we, you know, laugh at white people in winter who wear flip flops? Yes, but I understand it probably more than they do because I've been part of that culture. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, I, I am probably one of those white people in flip flops. I'm going to be honest. Flip flops, shorts, and the tank top. Um, so. When it comes to employee resource groups, I do have a bone to pick with them, which is that they are they are based primarily on identity. Um, I see there's there's companies, and I mean a lot of companies, with a, a black employee resource group, a Hispanic employee resource groups, sometimes Asian resource groups. Although I'll be honest, from my research on DEI, Asians are almost always erased from the DEI conversation. My theory is because they don't really buy into the victim game and you can't sell somebody a solution if they're not going to drink your poison. Um, I, but the problem that I see with employee resource groups is that they are based primarily on identity. And I think we could solve those easily by getting rid of the identity part and making it interest based. And I don't mean interest in identity things because I can see the DEI, the kind of toxic DEI that Kareth and I agree on doing that and saying, well, it's technically an interest group, but they're interested in anti racism and no white people are allowed. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you believe that let's say black people need extra help with financial management, wealth management to get ahead to create better wealth equity, then instead of creating a black employee resource group where only black people are allowed and Hispanic people who might need the same thing or Asian people who might need the same thing or poor white people who might need the same thing are not allowed in there, you instead create an employee interest group that is focused on wealth and financial management. Everyone is allowed in. It is not barred to anyone. It is based on interest, and therefore everyone can benefit uh, no one is excluded, and it's not based on identity. I think that would be a good solution. However, uh, when it comes to reforming DEI, I'm skeptical of DEI to reform it because I know many of the people who perpetuate the toxicity in the DEI industry are not going to be amenable to changing DEI. Um, I also think that many of the things that undergird the toxicity in DEI are not a coincidence. Uh, and this, this is why at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that we have to see past the euphemisms and the Orwellian doublespeak. So, for example, when they say equity, which usually means forced outcomes, they're not talking about forced outcomes related to straight people, white people, or men. Uh, when they talk about diversity, they are not saying we value the diversity of all peoples. They're talking about we want to fill these spaces with less white people, less men, less straight people. And I, I have examples of these things with me here today in case anybody's curious um, I will say one thing. There's 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 something I went I wanted to weigh in on earlier, and that was the DEI research. Uh, Stephen mentioned it. I think Kareth mentioned it. That um, a lot of there's not a lot of DEI research that supports DEI, and there's a couple of reasons why. The first reason is that people who do DEI research, as well as consultants, start from the unshakable belief that DEI is fundamentally true good and useful in the way that they perceive it, okay? So the only problem, if you ask them, you can find this to be true too. If you ask them what is wrong with DEI, their problem is that 
not enough people are buying into DEI. Not enough white people are buying into it. Not enough of the leadership is buying into it. That's the problem with DEI. They don't actually ask whether it works and if it works, who it works for and why it works, right? All those things we should be interested in. Another reason um, that a lot of DEI research is biased is because they focus solely on surface level traits as opposed to deep level diversity, which we know has more impact on organizational outcomes and relationships between people. An easy example of this is that even if you see a group of black people hanging out with only other black people, they've probably chosen to hang out with those black people instead of all the other black people because they like them based on who they are on a deep level. Um, another thing is that a DEI tends to use surface level variables as proxy for deep level variables. Um, so, for example, they might hire a very intelligent um capable, conscientious black woman to lead an organization. And then when the organization does well, they say it was because she's black instead of all the deep underlying characteristics that really make her a capable leader, right? This is about as ridiculous as if we were all standing outside in the cold. And instead of wearing my socks and flip-flops, I was wearing a big puffy winter jacket that just so happened to be green. And you ask me, how are you so warm right now? And you'll say, you might notice my jacket is green. It's because it's green. It's not because it's green. It's because of what it's made of. So that's one of the problems with DEI. Um, another problem, and this one I had never even heard about or thought about before I uncovered in the research, is some, uh, some diversity research that focuses on so-called surface-level characteristics includes non-surface-level variables like organizational tenure and functional background which means you could have a study that people are using to justify these toxic DEI initiatives. And they say, if you'll notice from this study, uh, diversity made the team more capable. Well, it might not be what they're implying it to mean that differences in race and gender made the team more capable. It might be that one person in the organization had higher organizational tenure, and this meant that they understood the clients better, they understood their company culture better, they understood the processes better, and this skews the results of so-called diversity research. There's a couple other problems, but I don't want to take up all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Okay. Uh, Anjali, please uh, go ahead. Thanks for being so patient. Oh, yeah. And apologies if I if I flubbed your name pronunciation. Very close. It's Anjali. Um, first of all, I just, I've really loved listening to these different perspectives in this presentation. Um, I am a DEI administrator in higher ed, and I'll start with a super quick story. But when I started at my institution, we were at a faculty retreat, and a professor came up to me at the cocktail hour, and he's known to be, you know, somewhat of a contrarian. He came up to me, and I knew something was up because the other professor sort of retreated, and he was still coming towards me. And he said, hey, you know, it's good to see you around campus let me ask you something. And I go, yeah, sh shoot. And I don't know who's on this call, so I won't swear, but this is what he said. He goes, don't you think DEI is BS? And, and I said, yeah, depending on how you define it. And him and I have become such close friends. And so he sends me articles about things that, you know, he's like, here's what the problem is, right? So I'm firmly in the reform camp here. I think that the principles, the underlying principles are really, really important, but I also see such uh, strange and sometimes nefarious ways that they're executed. So I have a, here's my question for the panelists or anyone. If we're trying to sort of um, have as the foundation of DEI work be freedom of expression and diversity of perspectives, something that I'm coming across is sort of the two extremes. So, you know, in broad terms, it might be the super woke and the anti woke. And the one commonality that I'm seeing is that both sides sometimes are, are restricting expression in some format. Do you both see commonalities and differences? And if so, can you expand on that a little bit? And any advice um, on that front would also be appreciated. Thanks. Gareth, would you like to start? Sure, sure. Um, Anjali, I, I hear you 110%. And that's the irony, of course, of this is that, you know, it's supposed to be about bringing people together, this whole diversity stuff. And yet it's about restricting our ideas and our, our connections to one another. 
Um, and sadly, you know, this, the cancel culture of which you speak, where people are afraid to speak now, they're afraid to ask certain questions, they're afraid to make comments. Um, we're shutting down. We're shutting down. And again, the irony is this is both sides of the extreme ends that are almost agreeing with each other by doing the same things. Like it's, it's just such a mind, you know what? Um, so, Certainly one of the methodologies that I like to incorporate is creating a true psychological safe space. That term has been hijacked, by the way, as well, where people think safe space space means nobody can hurt my feelings. Nobody can say something I don't agree with. No, no, no. Psychological safe space means you are free to speak, to ask, to question, um, and have other people respond. And you are brave enough to be who you are, show up authentically, but also hear someone else's contradictory ideas. That is how we are supposed to be approaching this conversation around true diversity. But if people are not, if that platform has not been set, if the stage has not been set for that, we're never going to reach a place where we can just converse with one another about this. Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, hmm. Um, can you say the question one more time? I want to make sure I, I get it right. Sure. Um, and it's, it was a convoluted question. So, um, and it, you know, if you are trying to be someone who's in the, in the camp of DEI reform and you mm. want to sort of have the foundation be diversity of perspectives through freedom of expression, and you run into um, obstacles on both sides, two extremes. What advice do you have on navigating both the sort of very woke and very anti-woke? Um, because I've, I've experienced both sides sort of restricting the freedom of expression that I'm fighting so hard mm. for. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this kind of reminds me of, I don't remember the exact name, but something like the horseshoe hypothesis that says the farther you go on the left or the farther you go on the right, you don't go all the way over here, or all the way over here. They kind of loop around and create a horseshoe where they're actually closer to each other than they would initially seem. Um, I, I remember there, um, you know, I follow the found, what they call the, the, the foundation of individual rights and expression or something like that fire. And, um, they say the solution for this, this kind of restricted speech is more speech, not less speech. Okay. So if you have a problem with what somebody says, like, let's say on the super woke side, the solution is not to curtail what they're saying. The solution is to increase speech and have a conversation about it. Um, to that end. I don't know exactly what I would do. I know I used to work at a uh, church and we had people who were very woke and we had people who were very conservative. So I'll, I'll have to check in with the reverend uh, on that, but I know she was very good at balancing the two. Uh, granted, what she usually said was she reminded of them of the reason, the non-political reason while they, why they were there. It's like, okay, we are not here to advocate uh, for making America great again. We are not here to shame white people for white privilege. We are here to, and then she inserted the mission, vision, and values and the principles of the church. Um, I think when it comes to an organization that has a lot of woke people in it and a lot of uh, people who are anti-woke, let's say, you need to create a strong, and it must be said, inspiring message that does not include woke or anti-woke, Okay. So you can't just say we're not going to talk about that because both sides are going to say we have to talk about this. OK, the woke are going to say we have to talk about this because for this amount of years, this has happened and this is happening in the world right now. So we have to talk about this. And the anti-woke people are going to say, well, this problem of wokeness is getting worse, which I, I agree it is or it's gotten really bad. Um, but that doesn't mean you curtail another person's freedom of expression. Okay, so find a unifying, inspiring mission, vision, and values that people can agree on or at least mostly agree on besides woke and anti-woke. Um, <clears throat> I would also say that you you could perhaps – I don't know where you work. I'm not going to ask. Um, but you could have people sign something. That is basically a declaration of, um, how do I say this, like a, a commitment that recognizes you are dedicated to the freedom of speech and you shall not infringe upon the freedom of speech of other people. So, for example, when I was in my undergraduate program, we had to sign something that said, we will not film in classroom without people's knowing. We will not behave 
abhorrently, basically all this kind of stuff. It was a commitment to uh, academic integrity, basically. We had to sign something like that, too. So you might, I say might, I haven't thought this through. I'm just going off the cuff right now. You might consider having something like a formal declaration of um, a commitment to valuing people's freedom of speech and differing viewpoints. Just just to plug our own website, uh, our, our, uh, we have an ethos section on our civic website that might be some help in that, answering that question. I'm not sure, but um, any uh, any questions from the audience? Georgia, slight hesitation. This isn't really a question. It's just that uh, observation that that I think one problem with the woke and anti the the anti woke and the woke and is that people don't agree on what the common mission is. So you can't say, "Look, we're not here to do that. We're here to do. We're d here to." Um, advance our mission. And if you're talking about a university, I think one of the um, problems is that we don't agree anymore on what a university is for. So there's no sort of common unifying mission. We can say, we're here to do this, because that's precisely what we disagree about. I think that's why it's so much easier to pursue this work in corporate America versus in academia. Because corporate America, the mission is to make a profit, right? Mm -hmm. They can agree, bottom line. And in order to do that, they need a cohesive um, workspace where people are communicating, where there is productivity. And if there is a, a, a chink in the armor, if there is, you know, something that is disrupting that, they know they can address it because their ultimate goal is the same. But in academia, there is now this, um, you know, there's not discernment onto where as to what it should be for. I think we just got a university wide email that went out uh, discussing whether the department should be making political statements or not. Like that's the discussion to be had. So um, can I take one one from the Zoom and one? Uh, Robert, I think you've had your hand up for a while. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, uh, two, but I'll try to keep them short. Um, I, I teach at a community college in California, and uh, one of the first things back in 2016, I was on a hiring committee, and the HR person comes in and, and says, we, we do a point system to rank candidates, and he says, uh, we can't give points based on immutable characteristics such as race, but it'd be really nice if we hired a person of color, um, <clears throat> and it seems like that's that's a fairly common thing. Um, that I've experienced uh, from from time to time, and I'm kind of wondering how much of uh, DEI is just done incorrectly because people are trying to do it unofficially or or, or un, you know in the margins or where people won't notice. And when you're doing it like that, when you can't just be uh, open about it, um, then then nobody can really talk about what they're doing because they're trying to hide it. Um, uh, so I'm wondering about your, your thoughts on that. And and the other thing, since I teach at a community college, I'm wondering if uh, if there might be an argument, a stronger argument about DEI for a community college versus a university um, or a different argument, because we do take everybody and we deal with great disparities of various kinds um, all the time. You know, we're, we're not... Uh, um, we have a very heterogeneous uh, group of students, uh, you know, every semester, and we have to figure out how to uh, how to get them all up to speed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karith, you are you deferring to me, first off? Um, okay, well, I, I think your first question spoke to both the point Robert and I made about when DEI goes wrong, um, that it's the focus is just that it's on ethnicity, say. Um, I have myself been someone um, who has been blackballed, pun intended, maybe not, uh, from a co college in California because they wanted me to come in to do diversity work, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't vitriolic enough. So the form of diversity that I was looking to share 
uh, did not coincide with the messaging that they wanted to deliver. And so, again, I think there is this, this, this self-righteousness that comes with, you know, we are, look at what good people we are. Look at how, how we're doing diversity so well. We're making it about bringing the numbers up. Look at our optics. Look at our, and it's, 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 it's painful. It's painful. And it, it, it personally hurts me because again, you know, we are hurting other people who could benefit from having someone like you come in, but because they opted for somebody else who just happened to fit a demographic, their students lost out. That's not what true diversity should be about. Um, and you'll have to forgive me. I, I forgot what your second question was, but I'll let, I'll let Ryan chime in. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I remember your first question was, you know, basically, correct me if I'm wrong, how much is, how much of DEI is done ineffectively and inefficiently or bad because it's in the margins, you know? Um, and I would, I, I, I disagree with the, the, premise of that because I don't I don't think they're hiding. I mean if if you look at a lot of the universities and there are hundreds if not thousands of universities in the United States, a lot of them um have DEI explicitly in their mission statements or at least on their website. So they're they're not hiding in in our public institutions, they're not hiding in our private institutions. If you look at a lot of corporations, and I'm talking everything from big name consulting firms like McKinsey and Company, Bain and Company, um, uh, Deloitte, again, they're not hiding it. It's there. It's one of their main tabs. They talk about how they are dedicated and committing, committed to discriminatory uh, hiring and promotional decisions. They don't put it like that. They say we are dedicated to doubling the number of black employees put into leadership positions, but people don't get there. Uh, into leadership positions unless they're hired into them or promoted into them, which are workplace outcomes, and they're using race as a characteristic there. You know, DEI is throughout so many things that I don't think that we can say that they are hiding it anymore. Um, as to the community college question, I don't think it necessarily matters. Uh, DEI doesn't necessarily matter that much. There are certain things that work for people in general to succeed. There are certain things that work for students to succeed. If you tell a student that it is okay, this is just an example, right? If you tell a student that it is okay to not study and to, let's say, drink and party before a big test, and you'll see this if you're in a college, you'll see that some students will, will turn down their friends from drinking and partying because they're committed to doing well. And other students say, eh, it's my first year of college. And they say that the second year and the third year, I knew people like that. And before long, they were failing their test. They had a terrible GPA and they ruined their college experience. Okay, so there are certain things that work for everybody in college, and there are certain things that work for everybody. I'm not saying that people start out at the same uh, place in the race that is life. I'm saying that there are certain principles that work that help everybody, and to that end, we should be teaching people how to leverage those principles to succeed. Um, one last final point, because I know we're on the time here. I want to um, talk about the the difference between the woke and the anti-woke. One of the things that I've seen with the anti-woke, and I don't really consider myself a conservative, I consider myself an independent, um, but one of the things I've noticed about the so-called anti-woke is that even though they are vehemently anti-woke, that doesn't necessarily mean they are like the super woke. What I've noticed is the super woke want to put their um, the woke ideology and do just about everything, whereas the anti-woke for the most part, seems like they just want to go back to the way things are. So they're like, look, universities should be about learning. Corporations, if it's a consulting company, should be about consulting. Coca-Cola should be about Coca-Cola, not teaching people that there's a problem with whiteness. Um, again, I'm not saying there's nobody crazy on the other side. I'm not saying there's nobody on the other side who is uh, promoting um, you know, restrictive speech policies or anything like that. Or they're not, I'm not saying they're not trying to ban books. I'm just saying that you know, if we're looking to create strong, fair, effective solutions, I think the anti-woke probably have a better claim to solving the problem. So we are at the end of our um, time here. I think we need to cut it. Uh, sorry, Corbin, you just caught in at the end there. Apologize. And... Michelle, sorry to just have to speak in person. But uh, I want to take a moment to thank our guests for this great uh, discussion and everybody who showed up uh, from afar and uh, close by. And please um, 
check out our website for upcoming events. We It's very simple, just a section on the website, civic.ucr.edu for events, uh, past and present, and learn more about us and uh, and uh, get on our email list probably would be a good idea. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in.